So I think we're good to go. Um, so thank you everyone who's tuning in. Um, this is the second event of the term for the Oxford Economic Society. My name is Nikhil Komeneni. I'm the events officer for the society. Uh, this term, all our events will be online, um, but they will be recorded and posted to our YouTube as well if you don't get a chance to watch them live. So last Tuesday, we had James Robinson from the University of Chicago, and you can rewatch um, that either on the Facebook event page um, or on YouTube, which we will be posting in our next newsletter. Uh, for today, we have Professor Damodaran, a professor of finance at the Stern School of Business at New York University. Um, and the subject of this talk will be the implications of the current COVID crisis um, and its impact on various financial markets and sectors. Um, so as for the format of this event, we'll have a 45 minute presentation um, and then open up the event to Q&A. Um, and if you would like to submit questions, you can use the pigeonhole link that I've posted um, in the discussion section of the event page for this event. Um, if you would like to follow along with the slides, I have posted those on the event page if you haven't seen already. Um, but without further ado, uh, thank you for joining us and feel free to share a screen whenever you're ready. I'm going to share my screen first before oh, you've disabled my screen sharing, so you've got oh. to allow me to do that. <laughs> Okay, should work. Okay. Okay, folks, you should be able to see my screen now, right? So basically, um, let me get this show on the road. Yeah? I am old enough to have been lived through multiple crises now. And I'll tell you, three things happen in every crisis. It's predictable. The first thing is you lose perspective. Why are you in the middle of a crisis? Worlds falling apart around you, you lose all perspective. The second is you lose faith, faith in everything you thought you knew until that crisis. That's why people invent new models and new metrics to get through a crisis. And the third is you outsource your thinking. You know what I mean? You look to experts to tell you what to do. They're all very unhealthy, but we do them anyway. And I'll make a confession. The first two weeks of this crisis, I went through all three phases. But you know what, in every crisis I've learned that to get back to steady state, to get back to some balance, I've got to find my way back. In fact, I'm gonna draw on my favorite Star Wars character. I want to be like Yoda. I want to find my serene space, a place where I can say, okay, now it's not that I understand what's going on, but I'm, I've come to accept what's around me and I can devise my path forward. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to take what I've learned during the course of this crisis and summarize it in the form of five broad lessons. Here's the first one. In every crisis, people like to dump on markets and this crisis is no exception. Dump on markets in what way? They like to complain about how volatile markets have become, how chaotic markets have become. And the next time somebody tells you markets have gone crazy, they're volatile, ask them whether they know what they're going to be doing three months from now. Look out of the window. Tell me whether you know where you'll be three months from now, what you'll be doing. I don't know. In fact, I know I'm supposed to be teaching next semester. I don't know whether it'll be online or physically. We're all uncertain. Do you see where I'm going? Markets reflect what we collectively feel and collectively we all feel uncertain. So no surprise that markets are incredibly volatile. That said though, I want to set up a way for you to understand what's going on with markets. I'm going to draw a distinction between two words we use interchangeably in investing and finance that we should not. The first is the word value. The second is the word price. We know what drives the value of something. It's cash flows, growth, and risk. It's always been cash flows, growth, and risk. So if you, you, know, if you, if you think about what we've added in the last century, it's that structure of discounted cash flow models, but values about cash flows, growth, and risk. You know what drives price? It's demand and supply. You're saying, but don't cash flows, growth, and risk drive demand and supply? Partially, but you know what else drives demand and supply? Mood, momentum, behavioral factors. In fact, over the last 40 to 50 years, behavioral finance has told us how much psychology can affect investing and pricing. So you've got the value process delivering value, the pricing process delivering price. Now, if you're one of those few people left on the face of the earth who believes that markets are completely efficient, then you know what you're going to tell me, right? Value and price are roughly the same. Why are we making such a big issue of it? But the reality is 
the value process can deliver a very different number than the pricing process. That difference I call the gap. Basically that gap becomes the basis for how you think about investing and how you proceed to try to make money or try to beat the market. Now here's the first thing to remember. While markets play both value and pricing games, when you enter a crisis, the pricing game dominates. Another way of thinking about this is trying to explain what markets do on a day-to-day -day basis during a crisis is an exercise in futurity. Yesterday after the market closed, as many of you know, it was a pretty bad day for the markets yesterday in the US. I got a call from CNBC and they said, would you come on after the markets closed today? And I said, what are you going to ask me? And they said, we're going to ask you why the market was down today. I said, don't ask me. I'm not coming on. They said, why? Because I said, I don't know what the market, why, what happened to markets today. You're saying, but couldn't you give us an explanation? I, I, I said, I can give you a veneer of rationality here, but the reality is on a day-to-day -day basis, if you ask me what the most dominant variable that is, explains why markets do what they do, it's mood and momentum. So let's take a deeper look at value versus price. In fact, there are three broad areas where the value game and the pricing game diverge. The first is the, the value process as an upper bound and a lower bound. Let me explain what I mean by that. Let's assume you and I both sit down to value Tesla. Now let's face it, Tesla is a company where no matter who you are, everybody has a point of view about Tesla. Let's say you're an optimist on Tesla. You love Tesla. You love Elon Musk. And I'm a pessimist on Tesla. You sit down to value Tesla. How is your optimism going to play out? You're going to get the much higher revenue growth. Maybe revenues of 300 billion like Volkswagen by year 10. Margins like a technology company. And perhaps you'll get, let them get there without reinvesting like traditional manufacturing companies do. Hugely optimistic story, but a plausible one. You're going to come with the value of Tesla. But there's an upper bound. It might be $1,000 per share, but you can't push above that. I could be a pessimist on Tesla, put much lower revenue growth, much lower margins, much more reinvestment, come up with a lower value, but there's a lower bound. Value as an upper and a lower bound. In contrast, if you ask me what's the highest price Tesla can trade at, my answer is I have no idea. There is no upper bound. Mood can take you to whatever number you want it to. Remember the famous tulip bulb craze in Holland. It was in the, back in the middle ages where people were paying 10, they were selling their house and buying one tulip bulb. You're saying what crazy people, they were playing a pricing game. Essentially there was no upper bound in the price. I used to think there was a lower bound in the price. You know what that lower bound was? Zero, I thought the price can't be lower than zero. In every crisis, you learn something new. And in this one, I learned that that lower bound doesn't even apply. The price can drop below zero. Hang on a few slides and I'll give you an example of exactly when I found out that reality. So value is an upper and a lower bound, price doesn't. Pricing is a reactive process. You know what I mean by reactive process? To win at the pricing game. If you're a trader, you're up playing the pricing game. Here's what you need to do. Remember the old Keynesian description of the stock market as a beauty contest? Where your job is to not judge who the best looking person on the stage is, but to judge who the remaining judges think the best looking person on the stage is. That's what traders do. They don't try to decide what the price will do. They look at what other traders are doing and they try to react. Pricing is a reactive game. In contrast, value is proactive. If you ask me to value Boeing, I could look at all of their history, but it doesn't matter. The value of Boeing lies in the future. I have to make my best estimates for the future. Price is reactive, value is proactive. And here's the final difference. I told you the value process and the pricing process can yield a gap. And there are some people out there who believe the gap always has to close. If you're an old time value investor, you know who I'm talking about, the people who go to Omaha every year, pray at the altar, Warren Buffett, you believe the gap always closes and you get rewarded for your virtue. Let go of that thought. There can be a gap and the gap can actually get bigger over time. There is nothing guaranteeing that the gap will close in this process. Those are three big differences I want you to keep in mind as I take you on a journey on what's happened during the last eight months in markets. So to set the, the game rolling, I'm gonna take you back to the start of 2020. Seems like a lifetime, you know, lifetime ago, right? 
But if you think about where we were at the start of 2020, we were coming off an incredibly strong year for stock markets in 2019. In 2019, US equities were about 30%, were a, had a return of about 30%. Global equities had done really well in 2019. So starting 2020, we felt pretty good, right? And in the first few weeks, until about February 14, that good feeling continued. Stocks continued to go up. On February 14, did we know there was a virus lurking around the world? Yes, but we thought it was going to be in Asia and on cruise ships. That's what we thought. And on February 14, we saw a new story out of Italy, which said that the Italian government had found a couple of hundred COVID cases in Italy, and none of those people had been in China or on a cruise ship. And all of a sudden, we all woke up to this collective, oh my God, this virus could go global. And guess what? Over the next five weeks, markets imploded. And that word I'm using intentionally, because during that period, here's what you saw the S&P 500 do. It was down 34%. The NASDAQ was down 30%. That five week period was essentially a very bad bear market in five weeks. If you get a chance, go back and look at the news stories on March 23rd, the world was ending. You were told to sell all stocks and run for the hills. The end was coming. For whatever reason, the day after you woke up and the mood had shifted. And over the next two months, take a look at what stocks did. They went on this binge of buying, pushing prices back, perhaps not to where they were before the crisis, but you recovered almost two thirds of the loss you had in the first five weeks in the next two months. And after May 22nd, stocks settled into this upward motion. And it, was not, it wasn't as steep as it was in those two months, but stocks continue to climb. This graph runs all the way through August 14th. Six months after the crisis, the S&P 500 was back to where it was on February 14th. The NASDAQ was higher than where it was on February 14th. This has been a very strange six to eight month period since February 14th. Now, as stocks were going through this collapse initially, recovery, and then the slower recovery, let's see what the other markets were doing, starting with the treasuries. In the first five weeks, when people were selling off stocks, they were panicking. Guess what they were doing? You know the words flight to safety that you hear in every crisis? Sounds fancy, but here's what people were doing. They, they were selling stocks. They were taking the cash and buying what they thought was safe. And for decades, for better or worse, whether you like it or not, US treasuries have been one of those places investors go to. So they're bringing their money to treasuries, pushing up the price of T-bonds and T-bills. And as they're pushing up the prices, take a look at what's happening to treasury rates across the board. The 30-year rate, the 20-year rate, the 10-year rate, the six-month rate, the three-month rate, they're all collapsing. The three-month rate went from about 1% down to zero, close to zero. The 10-year rate went from 1.7% to 0.7%. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's easy to explain. The Fed did it. You know what? The Fed did not speak up till March 15. They were shell-shocked to the point that they were shut down. March 15, they finally said they were going to go back to what they tried in 2008, quantitative easing, a fancy word for willing to spend billions of dollars buying treasuries to keep the rates up. But guess what? The rates were already down. You don't have to do a thing. So the markets yawned and said, hey, try something new. Eight days later, on March 23rd, the Fed came back and said, hey, we're going to continue quantitative easing, but in addition, we're going to do something we did not do very much in 2008. We're going to be a backstop in the private lending market. You know what that means, right? Basically, they said, we're going to lend money to companies in trouble, buy corporate bonds of companies whose bonds have collapsed. That announcement, more than any other, seemed to be the trigger that turned the market around. Now, I've described the Fed on my, in my blog as the Wizard of Oz. If you've ever seen the movie, you know how much power the Wizard of Oz had in that movie? He had no power. He was this little guy with little, you know, basically sitting behind a curtain, acting like he had power. The power that the wizard had came from the perception that he had power. I described the Fed as the Wizard of Oz because the Fed really has very little power in terms of actual power, but the words it uses in the actions can cause others to bloom. That March 23rd announcement that they're going to be a backstop in the private lending market was announced with a lot of fanfare. The amount of money the Fed has actually spent being a backstop is trivial. 
It's been about $12 billion in a market that's $8 trillion. Nobody, it's like penny change. But that action seemed to turn markets around. So as the treasuries were moving, corporate bond yield spreads were also changing. So in the first five weeks, so I want you to think about this collection of markets moving. Markets never move in a vacuum. Stock markets are collapsing in the first five weeks. Treasury rates are dropping. And in the corporate bond market, default spreads were widening. Why? Because people were scared. When people are scared, they charge a higher price for default risk. So in the first five weeks, you see the default spreads widening. By how much? The triple B default spread went from 1.3% to 3.7%, almost tripling over the course of five weeks. And then just as stocks turned around, corporate bond spreads start to turn around. And if you look at what's happened since, they're not back to where they were before the crisis, but they've dropped back towards where they were before the crisis. So stocks down and then up, treasury rates down and stayed down, corporate bond spread, spreads up and they've dropped off. Let's look at what happened to commodities. And I'm going to focus on two commodities, oil and copper. Why those two? Because they're both economically sensitive commodities. And let's face it, we knew starting in February that this crisis was going to slow and damage the global economy. And in the first five weeks, guess what? The markets built that in. Copper prices were down about 16% in the first five weeks of this crisis. But oil prices? And I've tracked two different oil prices here. Brent crude, which is a price of global oil, and West Texas crude, which is a price of US oil, dropped by more than 50%. Clearly, there's something else going on in the oil market besides COVID. That something else could have been the tussle between Saudi Arabia and Russia, maybe a desire to bring US shale oil down. Whatever it is, oil prices are imploding. The first few weeks, as stocks are collapsing, commodity prices are dropping. And just as stocks are recovering, default spreads are dropping back down. See what happened to commodity prices? By the time you get to August 14, copper is trading at, 10, at a price 11% higher than it was in February 14. For better or worse, the copper market is saying, what global economic slowdown? Oil prices are still down, but they're down only 20% relative to 50% they were before the crisis. Finally, I looked at two other investments. The first was gold. Why? Because gold has been a crisis asset of long standing. For hundreds of years, whenever people got scared, they bought gold. And during this crisis, it kind of held on to that status. In what way? Take a look at, take a look at gold prices. In that, those first five weeks when stock and bond prices were imploding, gold prices actually held their own. And over the entire crisis period, gold is up about 23%. So gold has held its own as a crisis asset. You know what the other item I'm tracking here is? It's Bitcoin. You're saying, why are you pairing Bitcoin with gold? Because at least in the eyes of some people, I've seen Bitcoin being described as millennial gold. What I mean by that is you were 25 years old and you panic. Unlike your parents and grandparents, you didn't buy gold, you bought Bitcoin. That's the story I was told. So I track Bitcoin to see it was behaving like a crisis asset. And I have some bad news for you. In the first five weeks when stocks were collapsing, take a look at what Bitcoin did, it was down 40%. In the next few months as stocks recovered, Bitcoin recovered as well. During this crisis, Bitcoin has behaved like very risky equity. So if, you ever, if you're holding Bitcoin, I hope you have a different reason for holding Bitcoin other than it's a crisis asset. It's definitely not behaved like a crisis asset. Now, as I've been tracking these markets, every week on Friday, when markets around the world close, I have also been going through an exercise. And here's what I do. I collect the market cap of every publicly traded company in the world. Sounds like a lot of work, but today's databases takes about 10 minutes to do. I download the market cap at the end of the week versus the market cap the previous week. I compute the change in market cap for every publicly traded stock. There are about 44,000 publicly traded stocks that I track. And once I've collected the data on all 44,000 stocks in my big Excel spreadsheet, I slice and dice the data. I first look at, by region, how have stocks done. Now let's start with the good news. Global equities by August 14th, if you look at them, are back to where they were before the crisis. 
But take a look at the ride we've been on. In the first five weeks of this crisis, you know how much money, how much market cap global stocks lost? $26 trillion in market cap. $26 trillion. And I can't even say the word trillion without freaking out. $26 trillion in market cap lost in five weeks. And it's recovered all of it back by August, August 14th. US equities, same story. But that hides an underlying reality we've got to deal with. While global equities are back to where they were before the crisis, the damage across the world has been widely divergent depending on where you are. Take a, look, take a look at African equities. Their market cap started at 580 billion, dropped to 363 billion five weeks later, has recovered back up to 455, but collectively African equities have lost 22% of their market cap. I'll tell you the three worst hit regions of the world during this crisis. It's Africa, Latin America, Eastern Europe, and Russia. What do they share in common? They're all emerging markets, but that can't be all because Asia is full of emerging markets and it's okay. They're all regions of the world which are heavily natural resource dependent and have a large subset of big infrastructure companies. And we'll see in, a, in the next page, those are the parts of, those are the businesses that have been worst hit during this crisis. So what I've done here is I've taken publicly traded stocks and sliced them based on sector. Let's start with the worst performing sectors. Energy, no surprise, their oil prices are down, energy is down. I'll come back to financials. Energy, real estate, and utilities. You know what they share in common? Big infrastructure businesses. You think, so what? You know how most infrastructure businesses fund themselves? With a lot of debt. In a, in a few pages, I'm gonna show you how deadly debt has been during this crisis. These businesses have been hit the worst. What's the best performing sector? It's been technology. But there's a hidden story that I'll come back to. Next best, healthcare. I've described this crisis as the most orderly crisis in my lifetime. Because this is not a crisis where people are selling everything and buying everything. It's actually a crisis where some sectors have been badly hurt and some have actually been helped by this crisis. You're seeing this play out in those percentage changes. I then took those sectors and broke them down into a hundred industries, a little more detail and listed out the 10 best performing and the 10 worst performing industries. Again, there's rhyme and reason to what's going on. 10 best performing industries, a lot of infrastructure businesses with a scattering of financial service businesses. Best performing, a lot of technology and healthcare businesses. This is a crisis where the overall market might be back to where it was, but along the way, there's been a reallocation of value across different businesses. So let me sum up what I've learned about markets during this crisis. If markets are volatile, they're just reflecting the collective uncertainty we all face. And if you think they're chaotic, come on, how can you have order? This is a market that looks chaotic on the surface but there's a remarkable amount of order that goes on under that chaos. And finally, early in this crisis, there were people who suggested we should shut markets down until the crisis passes. Terrible advice. To me, the worst thing you can do is shut markets down during a crisis because then you freak people out. It scares people. Let them trade their anxieties away. That's what markets allow you to do. So be glad the markets that you can trade on. Because a crisis in a world without markets would feel a lot worse than a crisis in a world with markets. So that's the first big lesson. We'll come back and look at, take a deeper look later at some of the breakdown. Second, in every crisis, here's what tends to happen. People with agendas come out of the woodwork. You know what I mean? They, they have this thing they've been trying to sell you. And this crisis is a great chance for them to push it on you. And this crisis is no exception. They show up on CNBC, I told you so. They wag their fingers and you guys should be doing this. I don't trust these people. They make up stuff as they go along. Almost everything they say, you check the numbers, it's not there. And there were two groups of people early in this crisis who were very vocal, telling me, wagging their fingers at me. The first were old time value investors who said that this was just punishment for a decade of overreach. You know what they were talking about? fact that we were buying all these money losing companies and technology companies and trading based on momentum. They said, this is your punishment. And then they gave me the prescription. They said, you guys should listen to us. 
buy some low PE stocks that pay high dividends and you're going to be much better off. Terrible advice in hindsight, but you're going to see, but that's what I heard in, in, in late February from those old time value investors. The second group of people who were very vocal early in this crisis were people who've always disliked the fact that US companies increasingly have shifted from dividends to buybacks as a way of returning cash. It's now well beyond a trend line. This is something that's clearly happened. In 2019, US companies returned almost two thirds of their cash in the form of buybacks as opposed to dividends. The people wagging their fingers said, we told you so. So here's what I did. I played some money ball. For the value investors, I can see why they're pissed off. They've had a really tough decade. And to illustrate what I mean by this, I've broken down what value investors usually buy low PE and low price to book stocks. And for much of the last century, value investing seemed to have won that game. And then you get to the last decade, see what happened? The first decade in a hundred years where growth stocks beat value stocks by a big amount. 1990s, they did, but by a small amount in the last decade, it was no contest. High PE stocks did much better than low PE stocks. High price to book stocks did much better than low price to book stocks. Value investing had a very tough decade. But many value investors said, just wait. Wait for a crisis and you're going to see why you need us. I said, okay. Let's see how you did. So let's see what would have happened if you followed value investing's advice of buying low PE stocks. In this crisis, you know what the lowest PE stocks have done? They've all done terribly. The highest PE stocks are the ones that have, beat, that have kind of done much better than the market. Take a look at the last column. All the lowest PE stocks have negative numbers. All the highest PE stocks, positive numbers. What about dividends? Non-dividend and low dividend paying stocks have done much better during this crisis than high dividend paying stocks. So if you'd listened to value investors on February 14th and bought low PE stocks with high dividends, can't help you. It's been a terrible eight months. So value investing had a tough decade. Guess what the last eight months have looked like? Even worse. And if you thought momentum was a bad thing because value investors told you don't buy based on momentum, here's what you saw. The highest momentum stocks are the only ones that have done much better than the market. This has been a very perverse crisis for value investing because you did the exact opposite of what they asked you to do. You'd have made a lot of money. And the real culprit in this crisis is debt. Companies with a lot of debt, and I've classified companies from the least debt to the most debt in this table. The least debt are at the top, have all made money. The most debt have been punished. So here's my bottom line on value versus growth. If value failed the test the last decade, it's failed this crisis says even worse. And in my view, it's entirely deserved. Value investing as practiced today, let me be very clear, as practiced today. You know what I mean by practice today? Read security analysis by Ben Graham, listen to everything Warren Buffett says. As practiced today has become lazy, and here are the three R words I use to describe value investing today. It's rigid. All these rules, I have no idea where they come from. Ritualistic. There are things you're supposed to do to be a value investor. I have no idea where they came from. And righteous. Value investors think that the chosen people, that the rest of the world has lost its way. Value investing is more a religion than a philosophy. Now, problem with religion says it's us versus them. And markets will just take you down. So can value investing come back? Yes, but it has to change. I have a series of three posts on my blog. If you get a chance, read If you're a value investor, I welcome disagreement, but I think it has to change. It's got to become more dynamic, more forward-looking, less rule-driven to survive. And if it doesn't, it's going to keep going down this dark road that it's been on for the last decade. Now, one of the device that I like to use in my classes to describe why companies are different is a corporate life cycle. Corporate life cycle looks like a human life cycle. A startup is like a baby. A very young company is like a toddler. You know what toddlers do? They stagger around, they fall, they get up, they stagger around, they fall. Then you become a teenager. What do teenagers do? Well, they wake up every morning and say, what can I do today to screw it all up? They have lots of potential, but every day they try to figure out a there are teenage companies. I described Tesla as my corporate teenager when I bought it in June 2019. Then you're in the peak of your life. Enjoy it while it lasts because you know what's coming? Middle age. And when you get middle age, you complain about it. 
but be happy when you're middle age because you know what's coming after middle age? Old age. And when you're old, you complain about being old, but enjoy being old because you know what comes next, right? You die. It's a morbid thought, but companies go through this life cycle. They start up, they become the peak of their life and they become middle-aged companies and then they get old and then they die. Now in most crises, young companies tend to get hurt more than older companies. Take a look at 2008, 2001, 92. Why? Because people don't supply them capital. This crisis has been different. I broke my 44,000 publicly traded companies based on corporate age from youngest to oldest. And just like the virus is playing out in the human population, guess what this crisis has been most deadly for? The oldest companies have done a lot worse during this crisis than the youngest companies. If I look at growth, the highest growth companies have done much better than the lowest growth companies. During this crisis, the young companies have prospered. The oldest companies have been hurt. But now, I'm actually going to look at just six companies. You think, why pick just six out of 44,000? When I tell you which six, you're going to see in a minute why I picked these six. It's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. That's a FANG stocks, plus Apple and Microsoft. Those six companies accounted for 15% of the increase in market value of equities during the last decade. Between 2010 and 19, these six stocks accounted for 15% of the rise in market cap of all US equities, and there are more than 7,000, came from these six companies. So coming into this crisis, they were viewed as strong companies. You know what this crisis has done to them? It's made them even stronger. Their collective market cap by August 14th that increased by $1.4 trillion. Remember I told you tech stocks have done well during this crisis? That was a little bit of a lie because if I take these six stocks out of tech, the rest of tech is actually down 400 billion. This crisis has made these six companies stronger. And it's, no, it's not rocket science, right? You can see why. In fact, about three weeks ago, I, ran, I did this exercise where I got up in the morning and every moment of, every, of the day, I kept track of which of these companies ecosystem I was on at the start. So I woke up and the first three minutes I was brushing my teeth, I wasn't doing a thing. But right after I brush my teeth, what's the first thing I check? I check my iPhone. I'm in the Apple ecosystem. Then I went down and asked Alexa, what's the weather going to be today? I'm in the Amazon ecosystem. Then I went and exercised and I was watching Netflix while I was exercising. It was the Netflix ecosystem. You know what? I was awake that day for 16 hours and 31 minutes. I was in the ecosystem of one or more of these companies for 16 hours and eight minutes. For everything but 23 minutes of the day, I was in, try it out for yourself. Take to tomorrow and check to see every moment of the day. And you're gonna see already why this crisis has made these companies stronger. So I started thinking about what is it that's different about this crisis? Why are young companies doing so much better? And I think the answer is very simple. During most crises, what I call risk capital leaves the game. What's risk capital? It's capital invested in the riskiest companies, venture capital, IPOs, they leave the game. In this crisis, venture capital, IPOs have stayed in the game. People have still invested in low grade bonds. And you can see that when you look at the numbers. So when you think about risk capital, you're looking at the resilience of risk capital. And that's what's made this crisis different. Let me give you some numbers to back this up. During this crisis, venture capitalists continued to invest in companies, even at the height of this crisis. In contrast, in 2008 and 2009, venture capital fled the game. During this crisis, IPOs have not stopped. In fact, some very high profile IPOs have hit the market this year, right? Nicola hit the market. You have uh, Airbnb lining up, Palantir coming. This has never happened in crises before. And one very simplistic way of seeing how this crisis has been different is I compute what I call an implied equity risk. And think of this as the price of risk in the equity market. And during a crisis, you know what happens, right? People get scared, the price of risk pops up. And during the early weeks of this crisis, that's exactly what happened. The price of risk popped up just as it had in 2008 and 92 and previous crises. But in 2008, it popped up, but it stayed high for about two years. 
People were scared and they stayed scared. You know what's happened this crisis? People got scared very early. And then that fear factor seemed to fade very quickly. By August 14th, the price of risk in the equity market had dropped back where to, to where it was before the crisis started. In fact, one of the things I do on my website is I estimate equity risk premiums for country. This is the most downloaded data set on my website. And during the course of this year, it's been on a wild ride. I mean, let me take you, let me give you an example. Let's take Greece, right? I hate to pick on Greece. Actually, I like to pick on Greece, but I have to say I hate to pick on Greece. At the start of this year, my equity risk premium for Greece was 9.64%, building off a low mature market premium, low default spreads. Three months later, at the height of this crisis, the equity risk premium for Greece was 14.25%. By July, it was back down to 11.84%. Take a look at every number for every country. You can see that the price of risk across the globe has been on a wild ride. And that's, I think, something to think about this crisis, how quickly the numbers have changed. Which brings my third lesson. You all have heard the myth of smart money and stupid money. Smart money gets in the market at the right time, buys the right stocks. Stupid money acts on emotion, does stupid things. And at least in the mythology, you know who the smart money is, right? Professional money managers, hedge funds, Warren Buffett. And stupid money is the rest of the unwashed masses, retail investors. And in the mythology, smart money wins and stupid money loses. You know what? For 35 years, I've been on a search for smart money. I still haven't found it. In fact, I'll tell you a very simple exercise that's been going on for the last 10 years to show you who's been winning. You know that as an investor, you have two choices. You can trust one of these smart money people and put your money with them, with an active portfolio manager who goes and picks stocks for you, or you can invest in ETFs and index funds. That's called passive investing. And over the last decade, you know who's been winning? Passive investing has been winning, hands down. These green columns are monies flowing into index funds and ETFs. The red columns are the monies flowing up of mutual funds. For the last decade, passive investing has been beating active investing hands down. And you know what active investors have been doing? I have lots of students and mutual fund managers and hedge fund managers. And I call them and say, hey guys, how do you justify yourself? You said, just wait for a crisis. Then you're going to see how much you need us. Okay, let's see how they've done during a crisis. During this crisis, you know what mutual funds have done collectively? They've delivered about 2% less than the S&P 500. 74% of mutual funds have underperformed the index. If this was the crisis where I was going to discover your smartness, well, I'd have to keep looking. You say, what about hedge funds? Just like mutual funds, hedge funds have had a tough time beating their indices. But with hedge funds, there's been this very humiliating you know, contest that's been going on on the side. Have you guys heard of this app called the Robinhood app? It's actually an online brokerage service. And unlike other online brokerage services, it came out of nowhere. It got a lot of new customers this year. You know who the, the, the bulk of the people on the Robinhood app are? They're people who used to bet on football games and baseball games. And of course, when COVID hit, they had nothing to bet on. So you know what? They went on the Robinhood app and they started betting on stocks. You go on the Robinhood app, these people are completely open about the fact that they understand nothing about stocks. I actually saw a comment there about somebody who bought a stock. He said, I bought Casper because I like the friendly ghost. Seriously, that's what is common. And he said, I don't know anything about the company, but I like the name. So you, you can define them as stupid money, right? But for the last few months, there is this contest that's been run. In fact, Goldman Sachs has been keep, keeping track of stocks that hedge funds like and stocks that the Robinhood app investors are buying. And over the six months, you know who's been winning? The Robinhood app picks have beaten hedge fund picks by 16%. I'm not suggesting you do something stupid like put all your money with a Robinhood app investor, but it shows you how empty smart money is that they can't beat people who are completely uninformed. So I'm gonna suggest a different classification for you. Rather than think about smart and stupid money, if you're gonna put your money with somebody, make it humble money. What's humble money? Humble money, when it succeeds, knows it's more because of being in the right place at the right time, luck than anything else. And humble money also knows when it makes a mistake, you got to look inward and ask, what did I do wrong? You know what arrogant money does? Every time it wins, it's all because of skill. 
And when it loses, it's always somebody else's fault. If somebody asks me for two and 20, I'm walking out of that room right away because the very fact that you're asking for two and 20, you know what the, where the two and 20 comes from? That's a typical hedge fund taking of your money. 2% of your wealth every year plus 20% of your upside. You're so arrogant. There's no way I'm trusting you with my money. Fourth lesson, we know what drives the market. It's cash flows and, and I value the index at the start of every year going back 30 years. And when this crisis, there were two things people pushed back on. Say, how can stocks be going up when the economy is doing so badly? How do you explain the disconnect between a buoyant market and a dormant economy or a terribly performing economy? I'm going to give you a graph that explains that in a minute. But you also have a more nuanced argument. Of, is the market in denial? Are they underestimating the damage that COVID is going to do to the economy? Let me answer the first question with a graph. In this graph, here's what I did. I took the change in stock returns every quarter going back to 1960 and the change in GDP every quarter going back to 1960. You know the correlation between the two numbers is close to zero. There is almost no correlation in what stocks do and what the economy does contemporaneously. Why? Because stocks are not mechanisms that explain the economy now, they're predictive mechanisms. And it shows up when you look at the correlation. If I look at stock returns now, and GDP growth one quarter, two quarters, three quarters ahead, you see the correlation start to climb. It's easy to explain why markets and economies are disconnected because markets are trying to forecast the future. Are they being over optimistic? To answer that question, the only way I can do this is to be explicit. So what I did, and this is June 1st of 2020, is I built in what I thought this crisis would do into my numbers. What do I mean by that? We know that this crisis is going to be devastating for earnings for companies in 2020 and 2021. So I brought those numbers down. We know that many companies are going to cut dividends and suspend buybacks. So I reduced dividends by 20% and buybacks by 50%. We know this crisis is going to make people more scared. So I used a higher risk premium. So I was trying to be realistic. We're in a crisis. I'm going to reflect the effect on my numbers. And what I got with those more realistic assumptions was a value for the index of 2,930. So I'm building in the expectation of a collapse in earnings, a big drop in cash flows, a higher risk premium. And I get 2,000, you're saying, so what? And on that day, the S&P 500 was trading at 3,030, four, within 4% of my valuation. You know what I get out of this? I'm not gonna be so quick to point at the market and say, market's gone crazy. I see a lot of people saying this, supposedly experts saying market is unexplainable, not true. It might not be a value that you want to buy at, but there is a plausible story for why the index is at 3,030 or 3,430 as it is now. You, might, you and I might not like that story, but don't call markets crazy because once you do that, you've lost all capacity to try to explain. In fact, I use a tool whenever there's a lot of uncertainty and let's face it, we're in a period of maximum uncertainty. I use Monte Carlo simulations. If you've never seen them in, 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 you know, try to find out how to do them because they're an incredibly useful tool. In a Monte Carlo simulation, instead of using a single input for each of the variables, I put in a distribution for earnings next year, cash flows, risk premiums, and I come up with the distribution of values. It's a much more informed way of thinking about where is the index now, can I explain it? At my median value, clearly the index was slightly overvalued on June 1st, but at 3,030, I'm at the 63rd percentile. That's not crazy overvalued. It was the 98th percentile we can talk. The market's not gone crazy. Perhaps it's a little more optimistic than it should be. And weeks like this one are reminders to markets that might, they might've got ahead of themselves. Which brings me to my final point. I'm a great believer in storytelling. I teach valuation and corporate finance. You what's storytelling? A good valuation, in my view, is a bridge between stories and numbers. In other words, you show me an Excel spreadsheet with a valuation. Every number in your valuation has to have a story attached to it. And every story you tell me about a company has to have a number that goes with it. In fact, about four years ago, I wrote a book on this, on how to connect stories to numbers. It's called Narrative and Numbers. So I think, you know, all, some of my books are a tough slog. I wouldn't want to read them. They'd put me to sleep. This, I think, is one of the less boring books that I've written. It's about connecting stories to numbers. 
And it's a five-step process. You start with a story for a company. You make sure the story you've told is not a fairy tale. It's possible, plausible, probable. I'm raising the ante with each of those words. You convert your story, every part of your story, into a driver of value, revenue growth, margins, discount rates. The value kind of does itself in step four. And then you keep the feedback loop open. Listen to people who disagree with you because they might give you things you can use to make your story better. That's what I did at the start of this year when I valued Tesla. I told a big story about Tesla, a company where its revenues I saw growing to 127 billion. To give you perspective, that would make Tesla bigger than BMW, almost as big as Ford in 10 years. It's a million and a half cars. That's a big story. I gave the margins like a technology company. Already you can see this is a pretty optimistic story, an upbeat story. And I have to be realistic. This company still has some risk. So there's a 10% chance they will not make it. With my big, upbeat, optimistic story at the start of this year, I valued them at 427. I actually bought Tesla in June of 2019 and 180. Got incredibly lucky. I sold it in January 2020. Happy ending, right? You know what the stock did after I sold it at 640? It went to 2000. Am I sorry I sold? No, I've got to play the game I came to play. But when you are in a crisis, you're told you can't tell stories anymore, you can't do valuation, don't believe that more than ever before during a crisis, you've got to go back to basics. So if you get a chance on YouTube, I have this video I created in March of this year where I took my basic valuation spreadsheet and I said, how do you value companies in the midst of this crisis? And very simply, that's what I did. You got to separate the near term from the long term. You got to look at what impact will this crisis have on near term earnings? And that's going to be damaging for most companies. But you also have to follow up by asking, what does this crisis do to the story for my company? Because let's face it, for some companies, your story is going to get bigger because of this crisis. For some companies, it's going to get smaller. You're valuing Carnival Cruise Lines. Hey, Carnival Cruise Lines is not coming back from this crisis in any way, shape or form, resembling the Carnival Cruise Lines that went in. You've got to be realistic about the price of risk. And you also have to reflect the fact that your company will not make it. So guess what I did? I went back and revalued Tesla. Has Tesla story become bigger? I think Tesla's story has become bigger during this crisis. You know why? Because its traditional competition has been so damaged. Volkswagen, Ford, GM, Daimler, been so damaged by this crisis that Tesla comes out of this a winner. So you know how that showed up? Look at my end revenue, since of 127 billion, they're now 200 billion. I am now making Tesla as big as Daimler in 10 years. I'm getting a little more pessimistic about margin. It's gonna to be tougher to climb to those 12% 12, 12 margin. But the value that I get with this much bigger story for Tesla is about $624, $200 higher, 50% higher than my value six months prior. But look at what happened to the price. It's now at $1,400. So some companies like Tesla, like Zoom, another company that's benefited from the, clearly the value has gone up, but the price has gone up even more. Are there companies that have been damaged? Absolutely. In fact, I'm going to close with the valuation of a company that has been damaged badly by this crisis, Boeing. It's a valuation in March of 2020, where I valued Boeing with a very depressing story of declining revenues for the next two years. Because what air airline is in position to actually order new aircraft? Shrinking margins and a 15% chance it will not make it, which is for a large company, a very high property. The value that I got for Boeing was $161, trading at 132. The story's been damaged, but the price is low enough that I actually bought Boeing. And finally, remember those six companies that I highlighted? About six weeks ago, I valued all six. So if you get a chance, if you go to my blog, you can pull down the valuations. And because I value them, because people said I have people, the investors have gone crazy, the price is too high. Well, collectively, these companies are not actually massively overvalued. In fact, one of them is still undervalued, in my view. Facebook, I think, is undervalued, even with the run-up in price. Four of the remaining five are within 10, maybe 15% of the value. The most overvalued company in this group to me was Apple. This is right after they hit the $2 trillion mark. I actually had to sell my Apple shares after I did this valuation. But basically, I am bringing into play every tool I had pre-crisis. I'm not going to change the way I think about valuation just because I'm in a crisis. So step back from the brink. Don't abandon everything you believe in. Go back to basics. 
and you're going to be okay. So that's all I have to say. I'm going to end my sharing and open up for any questions you might have. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we have about 10-ish minutes. Um, yep. I'm not going to be able to cover all the questions people have submitted, so I'll select a few. Um, so we have one question from David who asks that staggering concentrations to tech large caps, like the ones you mentioned, um, will only likely increase with passive investing. Um, but how do you think looming antitrust and election risks, which are very targeted towards these specific stocks, um, will be as a source of volatility in the overall market? That's, that's a good question. First, do you really think passive investing is why these six companies have increased in value? Let's play a game. Let's assume that there were no index funds and ETFs. I will wager that these companies would be up as much as they are now. So this notion that passive investing somehow makes more companies more valuable. It is true passive investing feeds momentum, but remember momentum cuts in both directions. When you have upward momentum, passive investing will feed that upward momentum. When you have downward momentum, it'll feed the downward momentum. So first I would take passive investing off the table. Active investors want you to believe that because this is one of the arguments they want you to use to say, oh, index funds are bad, get rid of them. It's a terrible argument to make because you're not making any legitimate reason why I should invest in it. The second one is a good one. It is true that all six of these companies, one of the risks they face is a regulatory or a government risk. Now, Facebook's under, been under the radar, under the, um, under the, the microscope now, since the Cambridge Analytica scandal from what, two years ago? Remember when the privacy issues first came up? And I actually bought Facebook after that scandal. You say, you're a terrible person. I don't think investing should be a morality play. The reason I bought Facebook is, you know, the people who are complaining loudest about privacy, you know where they were complaining, what forum they were using to complain about their loss of privacy? They were posting on Facebook. And while they were complaining, they were telling me details about their personal lives. Hey, before you blame Facebook for invading your privacy, come on, you are the one who gave away your privacy. So when I value these companies, I have to factor in that regulatory risk. I think it is significant. The company where I worry about regulatory risk the most is Amazon. You know why? Because the rest of the world wants to bring it down. The remaining companies will pay lip service to why governments are, you know, shouldn't enter the private business. But you know what? I am sure every CEO who's not Amazon CEO is whispering and legislating, oh, come on, you got to stop Amazon because they've realized that if it's a, if it's a, fair, if it's a fight between them and Amazon, they're going to lose every single time. So when you value these companies, that's the only reason I'm finding Amazon to be overvalued, to be quite honest. If there were no regulatory risk, I would be buying Amazon because Amazon will take over the world. If you're a conspiracy-minded person, be conspiracy-minded. This company is going to dominate the world, not by charging us more, but by giving us stuff for way below what we should be paying. Come on, who in the world complains about Amazon Prime? Because you get a bargain at $129.99. Not only do you get free shipping, but you get free media. You're saying, they, but along the way, they're just dragging you into the ecosystem. So is regulatory risk part of the story? Yes. You got to build into your story. It affects your growth rates and your margins will affect your value. So just following up on that, I know you said investing generally shouldn't have any kind of moral uh, basis. But do you think kind of, this is also related to another question we got, do you think this kind of shift towards ethical investing in the future and these like protests? Um, I know a lot of university endowments have had these kind of pressures. You that. know what I wrote? I, I, you know, this is collectively under the label of ESG. In, it's the most overhyped, oversold concept I have ever seen in business. Because here's the promise of ESG. Companies be good. And if you're good, you're going to be worth more. They turn investments, you invest in good companies. You cannot have your cake and eat it too. Stop lying. If you want companies to be good, be open about the fact that for most companies, being good means you got to make less money. That's fine. But you know what? If we want companies to be good, lecturing them on being good or hiring ESG consultants is not going to do it. You want companies to be good? then put money 
behind your mouth. What does that mean? Don't write to a meeting in, a, in your SUV and complain about fossil fuel companies. We, I think what we're doing with companies is we're trying to pass the buck. Decisions we should be making as voters and as parts of society, we don't want to make. We still want to buy goods which are cheap. We still want the convenience, but we want companies to be, it's not going to work. I'll make a prediction. 10 years into this ESG thing, lots of consultants and bankers will have made money on ESG, but the companies are not going to be any more ethical or moral 10 years from now than now, in fact, the title of my, uh, of, my, of my post was, do you want to sound good or do you want to do good? We've got to make up our mind. Right now, we're on the pathway of sounding good. We're teaching companies how to look like they're good companies, act like they're good companies, but they're not doing the things they need to be good companies. So I think instead of waiting for Amazon to become a moral company, if your moral compass says you should be buying companies with the products from good companies. Next time you go to the store, do your homework and be willing to pay $2 more or 20% more for the good made by the better company. Until you're willing to do that, stop lecturing companies about ESG. Fair enough. Um, another question we have is about kind of the smart money comparison you were talking about earlier. Um, this is an anonymous question. It says, while many smart money have lost large scale quantitative funds or market makers have kind of had an opposite effect where they've done very well recently. Is this sort of the future of the new smart money? You're entitled to your own opinions, but not to your facts. Have some quant funds done well? Yes. And in fact, there's a book on Jim Simon. If you, if you, if you read the book, Jim Simon was the original quant investor, right? He created Renaissance Capital, incredibly successful fund. Think of him as the Warren Buffett of the quant investing space. Most quant investors don't beat the market. Do some of them do? Yes. Could that be explained by luck? Many, many of them just happen to be in the right place at the right time. In fact, I'll tell you something. I have a very simple rule in investing. If you bring nothing to the table, don't expect to get take something away. What do quant investors do? They take public information, they put into big computers, and they run all these programs. Let me ask you a question. What is exclusive about any of the stuff you do? You have big computers? I have big computers. You can hire people from Stanford and MIT and Caltech. I can hire people from Stanford, Caltech, and MIT. There's nothing that is unique about this game. So this notion that big data and artificial intelligence is somehow going to rescue active investing, which I've always said, it's not going to happen. That's not where the rescue is going to come from because every, now I'll, 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 I'll close with the saying that I use, if everybody has it, nobody has it. And that's the problem with a lot of big data and artificial intelligence, everybody's going to have access to it. Fair enough. Um, and then since we're nearing the end, I'll just do one last question yeah. uh, related to the concentration in tech large caps that you talked about. So this question is from David who says, while US equities have done well, especially the large cap tech stocks that you have mentioned, um, valuations in other markets, which don't have these large tech exposures like the US did, have been comparatively depressed. Um, do you see this gap between countries and between geographies increasing as many of these large market cap businesses will come to the US? Well, I think I think there's a, there's a point of truth there, right? Because the U.S. has done well. China's run. China's is the equivalent of the Fang M stocks. It's got Tencent and Alibaba, you know. And um, but whose fault is that? That markets don't. It? I mean, Europe gets exactly what it deserves. It likes to take this moral pose of we don't like, you know, the privacy issues. You get on your little, you know, a little, a little box and where I, whichever park, Hyde Park, I guess, where the, where the people get up and make their speeches. So the EU likes to get up on that box and talk about how, you know, wag its finger at tech companies. And then it wonders why there are no great tech companies that will seem to be able to grow in Europe. No, so part of it is you're right. It does create this. It's a bit, and let's face it: the Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google are U.S. companies only because of their incorporation. They're global companies that have their base in the U.S. And that's the way to think about it. We live in a world of multinationals that, through the accident of history, 
or the nature of regulation end up being incorporated and traded in a particular market. So I think that, uh, you know, I tell, tell people this, you, you, you have to live in the world you're in, not the world you wished you were in. And what this crisis has done is it's taken something that we've been seeing for the last 10 years and put it into accelerated speed. We're finally making the transition from the 20th century economy to the 21st century economy, right? From manufacturing, smokestack economies to technology, capital light economies. And most people are being dragged along. They want to stay in the 20th century, use all the things they learned with the 20th. I mean, let's face it, finance as we know it was born and nurtured in the US in the second half of the 20th century. All those rules that you see in value investing come from that. And we're trying to use those rules in a world that has shifted under us. It is true. We're seeing concentration, but it's coming from the fact that the words, the economy has changed. And that's why the old antitrust laws seem like you really can't apply them. They were designed for a different economy. So I think this is a wake up call for all those CEOs and CFOs who still think they can go back to the way things used to be. You're not. The world has changed and you can either change and adapt or remember that life cycle? The, you know, you can be a walking dead company, a zombie company that continues to do the things you always have done. Cool. Awesome. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it's been an hour, so we'll wrap it up. But just for our members, um, next week we have another two talks. Uh, first on November 3rd, Dr. Hajun Chang, uh, who's a press Professor of Economics at Cambridge. Um, and then on November 4th, we have Professor Rolf Luders. We'll be talking about the Chilean economic experience um, and is known for being one of the Chicago boys back during the early stages of the Chilean economy. But thank you so much, Professor Damodaran, um, for your talk. Um, and for everyone watching, thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week.